Only God could rescue me. Only God could set me free. Only God. Only God. Only God. Hello, welcome to Only God Rescued Me, my journey from satanic ritual abuse. I'm Lisa Meister, your host, and we are bringing back today, Kate. Welcome back, Kate. Uh -huh. Hi, Lisa. It's Kate, good to be back. We're glad I'm to a, have I'm, you. I'm coming in hot. Yes, you are, and I wouldn't have you any other way. Uh, look, and it's snowing outside, but... But you're hot. It's summertime. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But if you have not caught up with Kate's first talk, you can go back Take a break, go back and listen to it, and then come back for this because Kate has just been through a very difficult time where her dad died in November and got whacked with all sorts of mom trying to access her, trying to hit programming and all sorts of craziness, which we're going to go through because... You weren't prepared for any of that. Surprise, surprise. I'm not. I wasn't. And uh, I wasn't. I was already going. I mean, let's be honest. Like, I, we had, I, when October started, I really, the whole like, window between October and right by now is like, Last year was miserable for me. October, and November, I, December, January, four months. Mm -hmm. It was Good miserable. Month. It was miserable. It was miserable last year. This year, and I, I mean, things are hopping really fast for me. Things are coming very fast, but we had Equinox stuff, Halloween, all that stuff, getting into the holidays. And, um, and really around that time I had had sort of a, a crossroads, so to speak, as far as like ch choosing to, about what to do with my, with my family. There's because you were still in communication with them yeah. somewhat, right? Yeah. But yeah. you weren't visiting them. You hadn't seen them in how long? Two years. Okay. But you were still talking periodically mm -hmm. okay yep. and uh they had gotten this um sort of a be in their bonnet that they had to come here and they had to bring me some sort of picture they had for me and i kept telling them i don't <laughs> i don't want any pictures so so this is terrifying for a survivor it's been a couple years since you've seen them yeah. out of the blue they need to come and bring you a picture now and First. since I last saw them, I learned I was SRA and DID. Oh, yeah. By the way. By the way. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so then bringing you anything at this point could be them trying to come and bring you back into the family, giving you something that could have demonic attachments to it. I mean, this is danger, danger, danger written all over it. Yeah. And I prayed. And so Holy Spirit mm -hmm. had, had told me, like, if they come, take them to church, you know, send them Bibles and things. And I did, the, I did send them the Bibles. Um, and I wrote their names in them. <laughs> but when I went to, uh, I went to church and I had a moment with Holy Spirit and it really came down to like choosing and I choose him over my blood family. And I just knew right then, and it was within this window of them coming to visit, that it was going to take them days. I mean, they're both in their 80s, and it was going to take days to come here. How many miles is it? Uh, 2,000 something. Okay. <laughs> this is serious determination. So, um, and I had... It's really where everything seemed to switch. I had asked um, my friends 
friends to help me to call them because I was prepared to tell them everything because I knew everything was on the line. And that was sort of a, a debacle really as far as like trying to do that. And I felt like there was something that Holy Spirit and Heavenly Father had intended. And it, and it was almost like they said like, it was like, well, if this ain't going to happen, then another way is going to happen is how I felt. And um, later that day that I was going to call them and tell them that my dad fell and not saying like, I'm not saying like Jesus won't walk behind him and <laughs> did anything like that. I don't feel like it's any kind of retribution or whatever, but he fell. And that just sort of started this chain reaction for a couple months of him. I'm trying to get some distance. He's not well. Then, then I find out I don't hear from them. Like I went the longest without talking to them. <laughs> it's going to sound bad, but it was like eight days or something like that. And they called me and they said to me, um, we're going to call 911. And I'm like, what does this even mean? Call that one one. And um, they meant for themselves. And they said that my father had been in bed and he couldn't get up and he had all this pain in his hip and he thinks it's busted and all this stuff. Um, but <laughs> yeah, it was just a mess. But then when they get to the hospital, like it just starts to be like this cascade of me wondering like, is this something that is happening inside? I was feeling like this is my fault because I had chosen, you know, against my family. And then all this is like happening. And I have this like, this lingering thing inside of like, this is, this is cause you, cause you were going to do that. Cause you know, or this is cause you drew back and, um, now that's shame that's programming coming forward, lot. right? That is a lot, but I'm right. talking about it cause I want other people to understand what happens. So you got all this going on and all this stuff with, family and your elderly parents and then you have societal pressure from the church that doesn't understand what you're dealing with who might think it's sort of terrible for you to not be there you know with the folks and um when he when he he ended up in the hospital and they couldn't figure out what was going on all these problems and Holy Spirit told me to not go. And honestly, I think that's how I'm here because I was obedient to that. And that was really hard to resist the heartstring pull, the loyalty pull that just drives in me that I need to be there, that it's my duty that I'm supposed to be there and take care of the family and do all these different things. Um, that's a big mind trip for anybody. That's a mind trip for a lot of people who maybe have like a difficult relationship even with the end of life with a mother or father that maybe you've had hard times with just, you know, in regular life, that's hard. But it's doubly so with the kind of programming that you have inside that is kicking off, that is driving you. And um, he, made, he made it through that first one and they put him in rehab and he just was sort of not advancing very much. Um, and that's where I started to get really see also like how my mother is 
Because let me tell you, just a heads up, it isn't just me going through this when my dad died. Like, it kicked off stuff in my mom. And <laughs> she got programming, and it kicked stuff off. And And it's creepy because she'll tell me things that are going on, and she doesn't know where, you know, she's not in that space yet of survivor understanding. But, you know... I try to tell her she has to get help, but <laughs> it's a lot. It's a lot just for anybody. So, um, I recorded a, I got a conversation, a call from them and it was really weird. Something felt really off. So I started, I turned on the zoom call cause I didn't know how else I'm going to record anything. So I turned on the zoom and I recorded it just coming on my phone. And at some point where it was both my mom and dad in the um, facility, rehab facility, um, there was a very weird conversation that I feel was like a coded message with a part because I was backseated when this happened. And so we're I'm talking like, dissociative part right now. So Kate then is not in charge. And a dissociated part comes forward and having this conversation and Kate's like, what are you talking about? That's what you're talking about, right? Yeah, I had it recording at least. So I got the whole thing so I could watch it later. And it was weird. And what it is, it's like, I feel like from an outside person just walking by, they wouldn't think anything about the conversation. They would think it was just people talking about dogs. Uh but this part, um, either I think feels relates to dogs severely, uh, like just identifies as, with like how dogs are treated and things like that. So the whole conversation though, was about dogs that are lonely and do they have a family that loves them and it was like this whole, I felt like this, the real message wasn't in, it was like talking about dogs, but it was talking about me and how I was, you know, we, we didn't have to be alone that they need a good family to take care of them and things like that. And it was like, this is not, this is not right. <laughs> like, I think I just, recorded this happening because I got backseated for it. So what were they telling you through this message? That uh, I needed to be um, with my family that loved me. So this has been programmed into you when you were little. Yes. So that at this, when your parents at the end of life, the other parent can start calling this into you. This has been programmed. So now we're calling this in so we can get you back. And that's what's going on. Because I hadn't come back yet. Right. Right. And I will tell you, this is, this is what happened to me in 2020. Um, with the COVID, my dad went in the hospital. They thought he was going to die in the ICU. And he was sick for a while and I would ask, can I come home? And he would say no constantly. And I wouldn't. And everybody's like, why aren't you going home? I'm like, cause he told me no. Like <laughs> that seemed normal to me. No one else could understand what the heck just, just disobey and go anyways. No, you don't. because you were controlled. Yes. You were under control then. So you were fine, but now you're not under control. So they need you home. Yeah. And so then when my dad did tell me to come, he said, he told me back then, come and come here and take care of your mother. And I did. I got on plane and, and did as best I, you know, for, but he made it through. So, but I did that. I returned immediately. And so here I am. And I'm like, I'm not coming. I'm not going to be there. And my sister then called and started pressuring me. I can't be the only one that is 
dealing with them. You have to do it. You have to be here. You have to face reality that you're going to have to deal with this. And okay, now that's, what's interesting. Yeah. You have to face reality kept coming up. Mm -hmm. That's code. That's programming phrasing there because that's not normal. You have to face reality. What does that even mean? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, um, so after here's what, here's where it starts to get even weirder. These are like the things these are like to everybody that watches this, just start making a checklist of things you might want to like keep on the lookout for. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Hang on to your seats. Be seated. I'm like, Be I'm seated. Like, yeah. I would, honestly, I've put the Kevlar on yeah. mostly and walked into the minefield and, and cleared it by stepping on them. Yeah. So yeah. I think it's not a fun way. And yeah. So after that coded conversation about dogs. Need Which you weren't there for. That I wasn't so you had to go for. watch. Cause you're like, I need to go home. That's my duty. Right. Cause that, that, those were our conversations. How can I not be there? What kind of a daughter am I? If I'm not there, that's my duty. That's what, yes. Yeah. I mean, I promised even I have taken back that promise, but I had, I've promised that. So a couple hours after that conversation, my dad just crashes and they take, I get a call from my mom that he's crashed. They're taking him to, to the ER. There's, there was all this problems and they couldn't get to, you know, up in the Northwest, they'd go to this other one. They go to the other one. Um, and I'm starting to think like, like, is this like a, a, are they like, I felt like they are hurting my folks because I'm not there because I'm not coming back. It's how I felt. Sure. Cause it just, I mean, the time I've started to pay attention to timing of things a lot and especially, and this has been very hard, but, um, so then he wasn't doing good. They flew him, airlifted him. Uh, to a, a, a like a heart intensive care kind of thing. The goal, the, the <sighs> the best thing out of all this is my dad got saved. Out of out of all the suffering. My dad is a thief on the cross. I kept asking him throughout this process and he would push me away and say no. And some other time. And uh, I asked him if he'd accept Jesus in his heart and he did. And I prayed over him. I prayed, I prayed Psalm 23 over him. Um, the next day, uh, I get a message while I'm in church that they said he's not going to make it. He only has a few hours. I should have known, I should have known that we're sort of hard to kill a little bit, but <laughs> we're survivors, right? <laughs> a little tougher, but they said a few hours. And so I went home um, and I, and I talked to him and I read, I read Psalm 23 over him. I read 
Psalm 34, I read Psalm 91, and Psalm 139, and some of Corinthians. Um, now, was this when a friend came in? Well, they came, after I read those ones, they had come over, and I was, and he started to, he was lingering, and, um, and I was reading that and I told him I loved him and I started telling him about heaven. You know, that we get that we get eternal bodies. And um yeah. So while I'm talking to him, at some point my friends had come over and I was honestly very blessed that they did because this is really hard to do by yourself um i was just so grateful that they did and while i guess during some point of when i was talking i had parts coming out because my dad um this is another theme my dad he had fluid building in his lungs from his heart not pumping right. And uh, he was drowning slowly. And he started crying for help. And then they gave him more pain medication and then he just slept and they passed. But during that part uh, of him crying, he, would, he said he loved me. And then he started crying for help. And uh, I guess some part had come out and my mom had another coded conversation. I don't know, how, this one, I don't even know the words, but essentially she said a bunch of stuff is what I got told that she has said some things, whatever part of me was repeating them back. And then at some point she said, and then we forget about it or something like that. She said, you will say, I will forget. And then you said, I will forget. And I forgot. And you forgot. I forgot. <laughs> which I've heard that same phrase from other survivors. Really? Yeah. It's programming. Yeah. Because your friend called me and filled me in on it. Yeah. yeah. Was it's funny how this works. So then it, so then this amps all, this is all amping everything up in the danger levels. This is getting more dangerous now as each thing is happening. And now she has called in programming that we don't know what it is. It yeah. could be suicidal programming. It could be going back to the family programming. It could be going and taking over for him programming in the group. Yes. I mean, we really don't know what the programming is because we don't have the playbook that she just called in. And I know like when I talked to my coach, she asked about like a mantle that's passed. <clears throat> and I think Holy Spirit <clears throat> saw into that. And I also think one of the reasons that this has been such an excruciating journey in a way for me i think also from the enemy is my dad got saved before he passed so and i know this and i'll tell that a little bit later how i know for sure but i mean i did feel it when he when he accepted that i felt him get washed white of snow oh. i felt it and, and Holy Spirit has, I'll talk about that in a, a little bit, but, but yeah, it's, you don't, you don't know 
you don't expect that that's necessarily going to happen like it is. How am I supposed to know that? Well, you're not. And if, yeah. if that person hadn't walked in and seen it, yeah, it's gone from your mind because they just erased it. Yeah. Who knows what would have happened? That's true. Or if somebody had walked in and not known what they were seeing. Mm -hmm. That is absolutely true. Which is why you wanted to come and talk about it today. Yes, because this is, this is, there's no information out there. There's no information. So, <laughs> and then after it happens, and we'll get into this, and I ask about it, then everybody's like, oh, yeah. This happened to me. <laughs> oh yeah, and I'm like, if I had known the, if I had an idea of what I could at least keep in mind for myself and and the people I love, I would have wanted that so bad because we were all un unprepared. I was already been suffering horribly since Halloween <laughs> and with a lot of other stuff. And so I've been working really hard. I mean, my healing is, is working, but <clears throat> it's a lot of hard work and memory work and stuff. And I'm like nonstop crisis. So this took my like already maxed out, close to maxed out, like just blew the top off. It was a and nuclear bomb. Yeah. Not just to you. All your insides. Right? I mean, if you have a couple, that's great. I do not have just a couple. And it's like a it's like a um a tour bus is full of pandemonium of all these emotions and thoughts and things and arguments and like yeah, so yeah, <laughs> but I mean, for my, I mean, I'm just telling you this stuff because it absolutely destroyed my support system and I've gone through the most intense suffering. I've still gone through it. And uh, you'll, we'll talk more about the fun stuff. <laughs> oh yeah because it's getting more fun it's getting super fun <laughs> yeah why is my hair not all white now i figured like i'd come in <laughs> it'd be all white <laughs> it's, but it's someday. beautiful and shiny beautiful yeah. and shiny highlights <laughs> <clears throat> so uh went to bed that night and he was still lingering and this went through to the next day on Monday and I was driving to um I was leaving to go to the women's bible study when I found out and I just remember like driving well here's I mean I got texted that he had passed and, um, and I, I was driving to it and I just, I was just like numb. I just watching the sun sort of set on the horizon and numb. And I had no idea what to do. And I had called my friends and it was honestly a really weird phone call. And I don't know if it's just cause they were like, freaking out i'm gonna guess it's because they were freaking out <laughs> i don't know i can't i mean i can't be a mind reader but it was weird and um i went into the church and i thought this is so strange because i'm like in here with these women and like what do i do like, I didn't, like, know what to do or what to say or anything, and my friends weren't there. And um, 
like my like my inner like my inner circle family wasn't there and um I can't make this up. I will just tell you that I sort of have a little thing about tunnels. Not not a big fan. So uh they're doing sort of like talk about things. I said, so while I was driving here, my dad passed away. <laughs> you know, and I don't really know what else I said. Like it's just a blur. But then like you know, because remember when I was driving, the sun was going down, and he had just passed. This is the sun was going down, the moon was coming up. But by the time I got in the church and sat down and told them, the moon finally got to a level like right above the trees, and it was a full moon. And they <laughs> they started going off. Look at that full moon! They're all like, and I'm like, are you kidding me? Like my dad just died as a full moon came up. This like creeped me out. Like something inside felt very scared about that. And I didn't understand why. And then someone else started going into this, some scripture after that about tunnels. And I'm just like, I'm like, now I'm like double whammy. Whoa. I'm like, oh. I'm like, okay, my dad just died. The full moon just came up. There's just all this talk about tunnels. And I just like, I, I like all of a sudden, Wow. I'm outside. <laughs> I'm outside. And and I saw my friend's car. And I looked all over for them and I couldn't find them. And and that sort of like where parts started hijacking me. I think that's where you talked to me. You were at Sonic when I <laughs> caught up with you, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So, so when you're when you're in Sonic and a part is talking to me, I know you're not doing well. <laughs> I have such a, a blessed friend who has been every time parts come out. She's like, baby, you need to go to Sonic and get something to eat and get yourself a grape slushy. So the part, and so it's almost like a training in a way when like things are really messed up. It's like I end up at Sonic with a grape slushy. <laughs> it's safe and it's well lit and there's snacks. So, I mean, uh, yeah. Yeah. So you weren't doing very well. I don't remember it. So I can't narrate that part. Let me tell you. So you wanted to go home and see your mom. Mm. And I'm like, yeah, that's not a good plan. Yeah. But you love your mom. I'm like, well, your mom's not real safe right now. Yes, she is. It's like, hmm. You know, it's like, well you know, let's, let's do something else. Well, what else can we do? You know, it's like, what are you drinking? Oh, I have a slushie. What, you know, what flavor? Is it? <laughs> How much is left? You know, let's take another sip, you know, and then why don't we go home? Well, I don't know where home is. Could you put it in the GPS? Do you have a GPS? Yes. Okay. Put in home. Okay, here it is. How many miles is it? 2,000 miles. <laughs> okay, that's the wrong home. Is there another home? And then I think it was the red line or the blue line? Which one was it? The blue line. The blue line. You said the blue line? I'm like, blue line. the blue line. Try the blue line. And so we, how many miles is that? 11. Yes. Let's go for the blue line. Let's go for the blue line. So we get there and you're like, this is not my home. Absolutely. You were convinced it was not your home. I'm like, well, this is where we're staying tonight. And you're like, I hate it here. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Oh. It, it's, I think it's beautiful. You've, you know, oh. your tabernacles here, your pillows here, Fred is here, Fred's your frog, you know, it's a really nice place. I don't know why I'm here, you know, and we just had this conversation talking you into the house, getting the door closed, you know, just getting you in safe, talking yeah. in. And this is three hours, within three hours after my father. Yeah. And my whole thing is, how do we keep you there? Because you're six hours from me. I can't just show up at your door and keep you safe. Yeah. It's like, how do I keep you from jumping back in the car, traveling 2,000 miles away? And here, here is the where it gets really bad. Because not only do I have the parts freaking out in every direction, I mean, I got ones that are hijacking me going to ATMs. That happened like within a couple of days of hijacking me. And I'm just like backseated watching them take money out of ATMs going like, what in the world? And, um... So many, so many parts just not understand, like just trying to understand and trying to like this whole, like, all of this stuff is just like, also just, it just exploded really. And I had no clue of like, it's sort of like when you see videos of like a tsunami and you see that person out on the beach, you're like you gotta get out of there. Cause there's like this thing coming. I had no clue. And well, it's, you need to be happy. safe. And every part has a different idea how to do it. About what that is. Yeah. So they're all like, okay, we're going to do this. And the other part is like, nope, we're going to do this. And this part is like, nope, we're going to do this. And you got a thousand directions. I mean, no. Chill. Same time. Yeah. And you're there watching it going. I don't Fight. know. What to do. Yeah. Mutiny. Yeah. So, yeah. Mutant. And then there's programming whacking around in there as well on top of all of it. Mm -hmm. So then the next morning, cause that's all like that night, right? The next morning, I honestly can't remember the morning part. So I think a part was out. I don't, I don't know. I just know like I was at my friend's house and I hadn't hardly slept or anything. It was just like in a fight all night. And I was trying to listen to the, the, just the wind chimes and just be with somebody. This is the other thing. This is what also I think is a danger that will drive you back. And I think it, I think it's just human nature plus probably, I think programming too, because all I wanted in like, almost like a hunger, like when you get hungry and you're famished and you just want to eat something, like you just start, you're like, get something that to be in the physical presence of people that I loved and felt safe it it is like a primal deep drive if your if your support system is already wigging out and wants wants to help and but doesn't know what is going on and what to expect. And all of a sudden I'm like getting hijacked and I'm all whatever is not me choosing to do that. None of this is like, I chose ta -da -ta, to go whatever. It was just this urge that to the point by the end of the week, by the end of the week, like I literally would have laid in a puddle next to another human being in a downpour because it was so such a need 
and and it was so excruciating. I was in a torture chamber and I was so desperate. And I think that puts you wide open to getting reached out to by the wrong people. And I'm gonna tell you what happened that whole night. And this is a little controversial, okay? And I wanna be clear because I really do support survivors, but you have to be very careful um, so here I am with all this going on. There was a new girl that had shown up at this prayer group. Um, I don't know her name. She left like right about when the tunnel thing kicked off. I don't know what else happened after that. So just keep that in your mind. That was the first time I saw her. It was the same time, right when my dad died. And that really, um, concerned me. And it's something inside that I don't even quite understand, but it hit something in me of like, uh-oh, this is, this is not okay. And, um, the next day, so I'm at my friends just trying, just wanted to be like with people that I love, like, just, I don't want to do anything. I just want to be safe. And, um, my friends we're freaking out just in desperation i think of to try and help in some way but at the same time like this is what i felt i felt like they're trying to help but they're like leaving at this like pulling away and trying to help at the same it's like this confusing message that I can't, I can't figure out for the life of me. And they started talking about, I think one was, you know, like to, um, I should give them my keys and my phone and I stay in my house. And then the only people I can see is when they would decide that they could come visit. And then they start talking about, we just need, maybe you need 24 hour monitoring, or maybe you need to start taking antipsychotic medications and stuff. And I'm just like, what is going on? It freaked me out. It, I thought I, I'm in danger and I couldn't like get wrapped. I like couldn't, it's like this expectation, like maybe normal people after a family member dies, can think straight. There's no, I, I don't think you could have a SRA survivor in the middle of this think straight at all. Not straight. No. I mean, like you're crazy kind of thing, but it takes more time and patience to get through because there's so many, like, I'm like, got stuff coming up all the time. I got parts like I'm fighting. So it's really hard to, to hear every single thing in a sentence. I can't prop like you just can't even get all of it because you got things yammering at you, you know, sorry, things I shouldn't say that. parts of me freaking out on the inside. And I just want like some place that's quiet and calm with people that I trust and love that's safe because the inside of me doesn't feel that way. And <clears throat> all I know is I ended up in my truck. I started feeling scared and I ended up in my truck and I ended up I'm not sure. I think home. <laughs> I think home. And then they invited me to come back again. And I came back again and just went back to sitting where I was and just trying to be quiet and not bother anybody. I just needed to not be alone. I felt like targeted and this is where things started getting really 
weirder for me. Um, all of a sudden, that girl, that girl, that Hassal, then all of a sudden it's, hey, this gal, she's another survivor. She's trying to get out of the cult, and we're going to take her to a, like a, a shelter house and stuff like that. And I think they said, do you want to come along? I was just like, I, I literally would have gone underwater because I just wanted to like not be alone. I wanted to be with people that I felt safe with. I would have gone, I would have said, you know, like I would have said yes to whatever. And so we went and while we're in, and I felt like this, when that girl got in the car, I felt like this connection, instant connection with hardly even talking to her. Um, and that made me do a big, whoa. And I remember. What do you mean? Whoa? Like, what were you thinking? Like, this doesn't feel normal. Like there's, I mean, I know it's the sense of familiar spirits, things that you have from the uh, occult background, you have to be very careful that but that this had something different to it and i can't explain it it just something off and she started um from my memory because i'm a mess self uh self reporting um that her mom's a witch that her grandmother's a witch. Okay, this is a person that's now sitting behind me. Uh, all this stuff. And I try and be nice and just like calm her down because, you know, I'm thinking she's a su survivor. And I really don't... I would say that she's a survivor that is still active in a coven. Is And I feel like she... I, I pray for her to get free, but I really feel like this was sent at me. Honest to gosh, I really feel it. Cause it was like, and I hurt and I kept hearing from Holy spirit infiltrated and separated, infiltrated and separated. And Holy spirit started telling me like danger. I started hearing danger, danger, danger. Um, and, um, That girl like latched on to me. And uh I try to just be nice and stuff and be supportive because I want to help other survivors. You know, because I know what it feels like and to go through all this. I'm I'm not that far out of it. And I just, I remember, I remember even sitting at my friend's house and having this vision of like, sometimes I get like visions of like, wit I don't know how to explain this, but like witchcraft structures that I see in different places. I don't know if this is like a special skill of mine, <laughs> but and usually, like, when I'm doing that and I see it, it's something I'm praying with Holy Spirit about. Um, and then I can come against it. And I and I see him blow him up and stuff like that. But I saw, like, this, like a, like a inverted, almost like, it, it looked like a cradle, like an inverted cradle with, like, tethers and sort of wispy smoke and I'm just like well what is going on Holy Spirit and why am I seeing this like what does this even mean and but things just got really weird and then 
I started having um flooding uh, uh memories and body memories and while you're in the car say that again while you're in the car or after uh i'm just talking like you know through the rest of the Oh, I, you mean like with dropping off the gal? Yeah. Just through that week. As that week okay. progressed, I'm, my friends are being sort of distant. They're uh, wrapped up. They're wrapped up in um, all the things going on with this girl who we dropped off at a shelter and then doesn't want to be there and all this, like, all this, like, chaos everywhere of people disagreeing and uh it's just a mess just a mess and um i started having uh i started having flooding fairly quickly um and i'm still having it i'm still in it where am i this this started the day after Thanksgiving, right at the end of of November. So first week of December. Here I am, eighteenth of January, and I'm still having flooding. Wow. And so, I mean, in a way, this is this is all pieces of my life coming together. But you need to be prepared for it because, and I think this happens in a way that this is my own hypothesis. So, you know, please, lots of salt. <laughs> a catopathis. Yeah, I like that. I'm not going to try and say it, but. <laughs> I think normally when you have a loved one pass, you're going to have nostalgic memories. You're going to think about things. You're going to replay things in your head. I think that's just sort of a normal thing, but I'm telling you, this is on a whole no another level of messed up stuff because I mean, I I've lost count dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of memories all about my father. Well, not all about my father, but a lot of stuff that has big things um, that I didn't know before. That all of a sudden, apparently now it's okay to come out forward with all at once. And I honestly think it's it's programmed to do that. I think it's programmed to flood you in such an intensity and I'm going to tell you, it drives you from your attachment system. I feel um, and experience waves of physical torture. The physical torture started the, the night that I was, my dad was dying in that hospital. I started having physical torture and it's, it is an excruciating experience for me because I like it just doesn't stop you know it doesn't it it it, it gets like to the point like I just want to claw out of my skin and I'm willing to like whatever to solve this issue to make this stop do you think this is pushing you to suicide I think it's pushing you to go home. I think it's pushing you to kill yourself or get back. That's what I think. It's designed, I think it's designed to destroy your support structure. And leave you so alone and hurting that you just go back to make it stop. It's like a like like having your foot in a trap. You're gonna gnaw it off. 
to get out of the trap right. that it has to be that bad. So, um, I, my friends were distant and I was trying to reach out to the church and it was honestly the most disappointing experience for me as a Christian. And I think it was a uh, inadvertent in a way with my friends because the church, the people at church, and this is, I literally had to beg. I literally had to beg in the women's Bible study Christmas party for people to, to be with, to, cause I still had this in this intense urge of being with somebody, another human, like I, I couldn't handle it. It was a torture device for me. And the, I think the people at church assumed since my dad passed that my friends, that they think, they think that I'm, and they've told me this, well, we don't know that you're that you need anything because we always figure you're with so-and-so and you're good that they're there and you're over hanging out with them all the time and you're doing all this. Well, I wasn't. And so I have my support system freaking out, pushing away. Right. And the church doesn't know. So they're not, and they're uncomfortable and I probably look like a mess. So that's what's going on. And church is hard for me. I do, I, I can be much better outside of church or a church, you know, there's a church in Texas that I went to that looks like the inside of a barn. I go to church and it's like a battle for me. So I think it, it's very hard for people to understand what I'm dealing with. So the, um, The day, the the first Sunday after my dad died was com was communion service, and you know, and it's <laughs> whatever. <laughs> okay, we're gonna do communion, and um, I just prayed with Holy Spirit, and I I did my best, but like everybody said, I did really good that I didn't get up and leave like I normally do and just go sit. It's because my legs wouldn't work. Like that makes it hard. I, my legs, you know, like fight or flight or whatever, like my legs would not work. I was stuck to that chair and I just endured it. And they were having a, a altar call or something like that. And I felt like maybe I could go up. I hate, I don't like going near the altar. It wigs me out. I don't call it an altar. I call it the stage. Okay. The stage. I like no, that. I'm just saying if I call it in my head a stage, I can deal with it. If in yeah. my head it's an altar, I'm just like, I'm not going there. Yeah, well, that's the word that gets used. And so that's very hard. And I got up this the weirdest thing. Like I got close to where that whole area opens up in the aisle and this man um, that I know and that I know and, and, and like, like he comes up to me and goes, whoa, he does this, he does this yell and he has this look and I see like, you know, he's got a beard and this bot, you know, some body hair, <laughs> whatever it is about that yell and the look he gave me, I was instant. I was in in flashback. I saw that look, and I just remember like I pushed him away at first, and I started switching. Like I push, and I I'm like I can't believe I just pushed him away. Like get a, get away, and I and I already felt like parts coming out saying like I don't like him, and my friends are saying well it's just the enemies saying that's the enemy because he's, you know, has heavenly father's anointing. 
And I understand it now. Like they're telling, they're talking about what I'm about to get walloped <laughs> with. It, and I got walloped. I remember looking at my friend and a, and a man, um, another man that I actually really like came up. So I had a man here, my two friends, the pastor come up with, he, he came up holding a cloth, a white cloth. I'm sure he's going to put oil on it. All I saw, like, it made me think of like, put over your mouth. I had this group of men and he's coming at me with that cloth. And I, and I thought he's going to put that over my mouth and, and ether me that like, I heard this. My, my other friend came up behind, there's another man and behind me. And that's where, uh, I'm suddenly not in the church. I'm suddenly in this hallway with these men trying to get me down into this room that has not good things in it. And I just remember it. I mean, I'm like in the, and it's like in a, like this hallway and it has like a blue light. And I'm just like, I start running in the hallway, but I'm in the church. <laughs> and then I, I must have got past it enough, past the guy behind, you know, past him. And then all of a sudden I'm standing there like in the aisle and I and I just see like my chair and I just like I go to my chair and I just sit down. Um well that really led into a lot of like it, it that was something from a memory that I had started having pieces come out of so more pieces came out and then the next week like I still like struggling to to find anybody that cares really and there were a few people and I hung out with them but I was very um it's like everybody sent messages that they're praying, but no one moves with their feet. They're just all, I think, pain and death and stuff and, and then throwing SRA, like no one knows what to do. And so they, they leave, they leave you. And when you're going through that and you get left, and things and you're having flooding and you got parts taken over and you got you know folks trying to access you um and and during that i started getting messages like this girl started trying to contact me um and I just try to just, just be like, keep her hopes up kind of thing. Like, you know, just, just go to your like recovery class or whatever, just like go do your things and, you know, focus on recovery. Like first step, like get in a shelter or a safe place, you know, like, but not trying to really engage her but she is like calling me and texting me now a lot uh and and i'm trying to like keep her i'm like trying to be supportive because i still think she's a survivor but something feels really wrong and this is very like an intense pursuit of me um Later that week, I was supposed to, I had got a couple gals I was going to go hang out with and they, I was going to go meet up with them at the gym because their kids were playing basketball. I had like a really good morning that morning, but then all of a sudden I spiraled 
like what why am i what now like why do i feel this way i like told him i can't come there like i like there's something about going there and i couldn't figure it out and the next morning was like the day I meet with my coach and stuff and I was walking in the living room and I looked up, but I have like a little cabinet that has stuff from like middle school for my middle school parts with all these um, basketball trophies. And I had a memory um, of, I mean, this is how random stuff is. This is, I think this is just like, I, well, I don't know. I just know the start of it, but, or the, I only know this little part of it. It, I was in the hall closet of the gym with my basketball coach. And he was saying, if you tell your father, I will kill you. And I remember, and I remember thinking the thought of well that's grand because he probably is going to kill me anyway so what 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 kind of threat is that but you know you can just join the club get in line uh, yeah kill cake club yeah well but that came up and then i realized like this is something with that this like this is something with that. And so in my session that I had that day, like we tried to deal with like the previous flashback and this whole gym thing and this stuff, just like I'm trying to process this and, um, I went to church that night for the ones for the Wednesday service and it was in the, it was in the gym. Can I just like, you want to know how the enemy sets things up for a more opportune time? This is how it rolls where you're already like, it's just the weirdest stuff. You can't even make it up. I have a friend who's like, you, you should write all this down because, and just call it like a, um, you know, like a story or whatever it'd be like a bestseller. No one would think this was <laughs> real, but it is. So, uh, I'm with my friends and uh i'm sitting at the table next to that gal who's now with my friends and i'm sitting next to uh some people that have masonic family history that have the especially the man has something manifested when he had told me that that um he had a family member that was like a 32nd or 33rd degree, uh, something came out of him. He like, like his whole face changed and his voice changed. And he said he didn't do anything with it. And I, and like, so that guy's, and, and all the basketballs are going, like all the kids are running around basketball. It's all super noisy. And then the guy comes out. It's not the pastor. It's the guy it's the guy I shoved. It's the guy I shoved. So here I am sitting at the table and I'm getting like ping ponged by two traumatic memories at the same time while trying to be cool in church and listen to a sermon. And I can't tell anybody. I can't. There's kids and everything. I can't tell everybody. I can't tell anybody. And I'm just trying to keep like from falling apart. Right. And, and that was really the night that my support system completely imploded because my, my friends, I think were just done and didn't understand and thinking like I'm doing this on purpose or causing this on purpose. And I literally can't control it. And I'm dealing with really horrible things. And, uh, 
it was bad. It was bad. Um, <laughs> so, um, it's very hard because I, I still love them. But things got said that were very wrong. And one of the things that got texted to me um, was, it's hard with the wording because this triggered me. Um. <laughs> Actually, I forgot the biggest part. I forgot the the biggest part that, that threw that off. It was that gal. So that night, that night after, um, you know, I, I got home and then the next day, uh, she texted me that she was going to a, a coven meeting and they were doing a moon ritual. Can we go back to the moon that happened when your dad died at the church? She was at the church both that same night. Yes. Yes. And now here I am, uh, what, like eight, eight or nine days after my dad passed and I have somebody messaging me about going to active cult meetings. And that was like the linchpin for me because I was struggling so hard and I was just in this torture and now this happened and it came from someone that had come out of my safety. That came out of my safe place with people I love. I didn't choose to have this person inserted, you know, and I tried to be supportive for someone that I thought at the time might be a, you know, was a survivor. And then when I get that message, I'm like, mm. We're, we're in danger. Like it was alarm bells. And I mean a major alarm bells in the fact that I literally spent about three weeks every night sitting in that chair waiting for somebody to come and take me. I just stared at that door and just waited after that. And so that girl did that and I messaged my friends and it just blew up. It blew up. And the, um, one of my friends had said something to the kin of like, you're drowning and we won't let you, we won't drown with you or we won't let you take us with you or something like that. But I just heard the drowning and the watching. Again, the enemy's opportune time and you're getting flooded. Um, that, uh, that, uh, it's also I, during the holidays, people are distracted. Yes. This is Busy. the middle of December. Yeah. You know, and, I, and I'm still trying to fight getting parts taking me back and all these memories. And now the people I love and felt safe told me I could drown. And what do you, like, what do you do with that? <laughs> What do you do with that if you're no, like a normal person? But I'll tell you what happened to me. Like, 
that someone, a man, a man that I felt was someone, heavenly father, you know, a Christian man, a godly man, told me that is so much hurt and shock and and things inside just just by that statement but that statement that whole thing unlocked i had i had um, i had a memory of being drowned, several of them. And uh, I want to throw up. Um, you have to understand that I had had like a lot of things of my father. I had some things, but I don't. I'm getting drowned and there is a man who I think is another programmer or a trainer of some sort. And the one main guy that I knew and my father watching me and, and I can see it. I can see it from underwater looking up at my dad do nothing and watch <sighs> and... And... it's going to be okay just yeah. focus on me here for a minute kate listen. it's going to be okay just listen to my voice um i'm i'm going to at least talk about it now yeah but it's taken me this long it's been a over a month to be able to like you're doing really good yes. doing really good but all that pain of the memories and my father dying and essentially a betrayal of trust with someone who I thought was a, a godly man that loved me, that said that to me, like, who does that? Who does that to anybody a week after their dad dies? If they're like, even like hysterical, like cut them some freaking slack. Sure. Like, that caused me so much amplified hurt because sure. that statement and him combined with my father in that memory. Right. I cannot separate the two. I can, they have like merged themselves in like it, like everything got blended together. Yeah. Very difficult for survivors when a ritual combines with present. Yes. Because things get very convoluted in our minds at that point, and the torture comes back and becomes to the present. It makes it very hard to think. It makes it very hard to function. Yes. And I've been having... I'm sorry. I'm trying to. <clears throat> you have nothing to be sorry about. You're doing really well. It is very hard. It's very hard. It is very hard. I tried no. to be loving. Yeah. I tried to be loving to my dad. I just prayed for him to get saved. 
Yeah. And I forgot to tell you that part when the one day I was at with my my friends, I was looking out the window and I had a vision. And I was just looking at my dad. And he was with Jesus and I can't explain it. It was, he was different looking, but I knew it wasn't my dad. And he was, he was happy. Wow. Wow. I've never seen my dad happy. Not like that. Not like real. Right. Happiness. And I know Holy Spirit showed me this is like a confirmation. Sure. Because let me tell you, the pressure doesn't stop from your family. So that confirmation helped me because my mother would call saying that she's going to kill herself. Or the, I remember after that, she said, death wins. And I said, that's not true. Death does not win because I seen dad and he is in heaven and he is a new body and he is happy. And if you believe in Jesus, that is what you can do, but you have to accept him into your heart. And, you know, I think she's, working on it, but it's been difficult. And, uh, how do you deal with that? Right. I mean, it kicks off so much in you. I think just a normal person who would go through that would be, have it, find it very difficult, but to go through that, with I mean I was having memories and body memories sometimes every two hours I mean I literally I've been here for weeks like just this onslaught and I spend my time writing it all down because this is all my life that I haven't had access to I, it's hard to make sense of some of them sometimes you don't True. know like, why all of a sudden I'm seeing this or feeling this, but like, or I'm having like my hands erupt in blisters all over and, but they're all parts that I haven't had access to in my life. I have, I haven't, I've had new parts come out and, and memories and they all, so, the memories are just so difficult, but sometimes it's like they start filling in on a, like a timeline and I yeah. try and record them all. So I don't, I don't want my suffering to lose what has come up. Do you right. It's like already been lost to me my whole life. Right. I just want to know what happened to me and I want to heal. But it is so excruciating to go through. When you are essentially just scraping by and your support system is blown up and you're getting flooded by everything, I don't know how to do it. But you have done it because you called me last week. I did. And you told me that you had a moment of warmth in your heart. I did. I did. I experience. I think it's joy. I think, I think it is. I'm not sure. Cause I don't think I've experienced before. I, that's the other thing. I have feelings come out and with these memories, I don't have words for them. <laughs> I don't even know how to communicate what I feel, but I will tell you, and I, I guess this is, is hopeful. Um, the last two weeks, uh, I got 
maybe a year ago, I got someone giving me like a word on Isaiah 54, and I believe I read it in my first podcast with you about an uncomforted city that's being lashed by storms and that Heavenly Father promises to rebuild it and, to, and promises that no weapon sh formed against you shall prosper and that you should be vindicated and all these things. Um, you gotta understand, I'm, I'm still going to a church with my friends that aren't my friends anymore. And it, when I visually see them, it causes me pain. So I, um, it's very hard when you're like four feet away from somebody that doesn't want you in a church that isn't coming alongside you. And I just focus on Holy Spirit. And he has been so good through all this. He has, he talks to me and he says that I didn't, that I didn't do anything wrong. You're doing good. I didn't do anything wrong. You're doing good. You're getting through. And he you... said, I choose you. He called me. He called me his righteous daughter. He called me his mighty warrior. And I'll tell you what I've heard for two weeks in a row is a vindication of what I've experienced. Holy Spirit, the first two weeks ago in church, I'm sitting in a room with the same people that we're not friends anymore. And uh, Holy Spirit uh, was speaking through the speaker and other people. And it was the same theme over and over for three and a half hours. It came out of the scripture reading. It was in the songs. I mean, you can't like everything, the words that, that someone gave, the pastor st didn't even give his sermon. He, the pastor, he just said he had to speak. And he started talking about Job's friends. Ooh. started talking about that we're called to make disciples and that we are called to love one another and we are called to be there and comfort the hurting and the brokenhearted, the orphans, which I essentially am right now. And the widows, we are called to, to be there with our brothers and sisters when they hurt. And in Job, if you don't know the story, <clears throat> Job chronologically happens after sort of the first few chapters of Genesis, then it's Job, and then it goes back to Genesis or something. That's what I heard. They say that in my church. It goes chronologically like that. But Job, essentially, the pastor said the best time Job had in that whole ordeal, and I know I'm sort of, I'm trying to get his words right, but at least that part, I know he said, he said the best part was his friends said zero words to him for seven days. And they just sat with him and witnessed his pain, really. They witnessed this catastrophe that has happened in his pain. Those are the best days. And that they, the friends, accused him that he is suffering because he must have done something wrong. He's suffering because he's not done, so that he has done something wrong. And that's not true. And I honestly think 
Heavenly Father picked Job because Job loved him, but he was the strongest one. He was the one that could survive all that and still keep seeking God, still keep seeking Heavenly Father in all of it, right? Yeah. And I felt that, and it and and it happened again. I mean, it's because it happened on the women's Bible study, and I'm sitting there watching this. Like these people are talking about Job's friends, and I'm literally I'm sitting amongst them. Job's friends are talking about Job's friends, and and I don't say that as like a condemnation. I'm just just explaining my experience in that I felt very forgotten. Yeah. Absolutely. Through the holidays, everything. You know, I had very kind of, I had, um, I had a friend that um, had sent me a, a present. So like on Christmas, I had actually a present I could open, you know? And I did have some people from church inviting me to come on, Chris on Christmas day and Christmas Eve. And I so I'm, I'm grateful for those things. Those are like islands. They're like islands of refuge in just uh, misery. So <laughs> Heavenly Father talked all about that. And I felt, and Holy Spirit talked to me. And Holy Spirit said, he sees you and he hears your cries. He hears them. Yes, he and, does. And he is he is speaking out through the pastor's lips. And I know this because when I try and talk talk with my pastor, he will admit he doesn't understand anything that, that I'm talking about most of the time. But his understanding and that and what I heard, I knew the source is not the same. You know, it's the using him to speak. And he is he is being dutiful in that, I think. But the next weekend, the next Sunday was oh. <laughs> yeah. The next Sunday uh was all about reconciliation and Jonah and about running from your calling and talking about if you are if you are running from your calling your calling isn't necessarily for you your calling is could be for other people to serve others so if you are running away from your calling you are not delivering your gift to the people that heavenly father had lined up for you that's true. And that they that they bear the they they feel they suffer from that. You know, and so he talked a lot about reconciling and and all of this because you know that's something that I had tried with my friends and it didn't go it didn't didn't end well. <laughs> But, uh, you know, uh, so that's just, I just hope like some of this helps people that they can think about this and how to identify it. And I'm not judging on, um, if you have contact or you don't have contact, I think that's all up to like each person and, and Holy Spirit and what he has in plan for, for them. But I think you need to be, to have a heads up if you're, you know, if you have 
that kind. And I honestly, and, and, and I did see somebody also said that they had this happen when they went no contact. So, I mean, I don't, I don't know if it's just, they got different, you know, different people have different programmings or things like that. But I mean, not everybody has the same experience. I, I mean, I'll, like, this is what I tried to talk with my friends about is like, they, um, one is a survivor and she, she has a completely different system and experience and programming that she has gone through than, than I have. And, and that's okay. It's just that we have to understand that there's, um, things are sometimes really complicated and, you know, and we trigger each other and we don't understand what we're dealing with because we don't have the playbook until we go and step on all the, the minds. So. Yeah. So be prepared. Be prepared if, if you're around a survivor. You got to have a plan. I think I wish I could have known and I could have talked with my support team and had a plan. And I think for support people, don't depend on your survivor to actually be able to figure that out. Because Yeah, tell me what you need doesn't work. How do we tell you that? Like, I can't figure it out for myself. Yeah. And, and I think it's to have a frank and honest discussion about like, we know that this could potentially kick off a bunch of stuff that you haven't remembered yet because your parts finally feel like they're safe enough to let it out or it, I mean, it just comes and I just wish I would have had, a, had like an idea of you know, like if you go on a trip, if you're going to go hiking or whatever else, I'll you may not be like me, but I would like to do some um, analysis before about where I'm actually going. And, you know, so I know like what I need to bring and what I can expect generally. And I think it's sort of the same thing with this is that this experience is designed to destabilize you. Uh, completely implode your support system. I mean, I'm yeah. on the verge of losing church, really. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> uh, I'm still going to go. I just, it's difficult. And It's mind blowing at the, what can enter in, right? So I had memories, I had accessing, I had programming to return, I had suicide programming, I've got, I'm not sure if it's punishing programming or what's going on, but this internal torture, I'm attached to people, I have like an emotional attachment that causes me pain when I'm away. I also think that's a program that 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 the the longer that I'm away from these people that I feel this attachment, my friends, like I feel physical torture pain. I wish I knew how to break that. You know, yeah. because I'm feeling pain over not being near people that I that don't want me. Yeah, that's fun. Yeah, how does that stop? It's like right. a rock that you can't get off of. Right. <laughs> yeah. And I'm talking like embarrassing groaning out loud in front of people, kind of. Yeah. Torture. Yeah. 
So we need teams. We need churches that have compassion and understand what's going on that can go in when a survivor has a parent die and can help manage. And help the support team. Yeah. Help the support team that's in place because you're about to go to like, <laughs> you ever, <laughs> this is maybe this because of my old history, but uh, there was a movie a long time ago, sort of spoof called Spinal Tap. And they, <laughs> they say, I'm turning it up to 11. Like the, the knob only goes to like, we're trying to get it to the max volume. Like it's going to go beyond what you anticipate. And it's, it's, uh, yeah, it is. It, it's, I mean, it's like going through what you went through. Yeah. Accelerated. And, right. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you sharing this with us and helping to prepare other survivors and helping the helpers so that they can prepare. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And to help deprogram. And part of deprogramming is understanding that this programming is there mm -hmm. so that we can take these programs to the Lord and help him to help us. Mm -hmm. to deprogram them. Yeah. And what would you, I mean, you were sort of a helper to me in this as a friend, um, you know, as you could. And I mean, what did you feel like on this? Like, Yeah, it was, we need a team around you as best we can. We need to get those keys away from you. And the phone, because like your mom, without somebody in the house with you to monitor it, it was too dangerous. Yeah. It was terrifying. You know? Right. It's like I wanted to get there so bad and couldn't. It's like, I, you know, I really want to have a team that we can dispatch in times like this. Like Ghostbusters. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like we will go and we will be around the clock. Somebody awake at all hours watching over. And then you can keep your keys. You can keep your phone, whatever. And just keep an eye on you. You know, you know? what's ironic is that my mother ended up having a better, more responsive support system than well, I sure. did. Well, sure, because they're playing the game. You're they not playing the game. They made a calendar, and they had people. They they have like a calendar with things to do and people to call on her and check on her and take her to do stuff and all but these we, things. We are the black sheep. We are kicked out and we are isolated over and over again in every area. And blamed. And blamed that. Here's, here's, here's some things that I have gotten told. And I just, I'm just going to be, I'm just being frank. Cause I just want to help other people not go through what I've gone through. And it fly. Okay. And, um, why is it that this is what I said? Why is it like, I'll watch you you'll be next to somebody else and you'll just be fine. And then you're with us and then like all these parts come out and you're not like adult Kate and what the heck. Like as if I actually can control that. And I'd say like, this is, that's, I mean, they're coming out because we love you. And we feel safe and they, and my parts do. I don't know who that other person is, right? They're getting whatever, you know, I don't know. So that's one of the things. And then the assumption, I think, is a dangerous assumption that we can somehow control and choose. Maybe some people can. They can take whatever they got and they can put it in a box and tuck it away and then they pull it out later. I think there's people that can do that. That is not me. Right. 
my system is not like that. Right. If I had a box, you know how much stuff I'd be, I'd be like jumping up and down on the lid with so much stuff that I put in it because True. I'm literally having like, I mean, Holy Spirit told me in September, like, buckle up. You're going to have to write a lot. I thought he was thinking like a blog, not like, uh, you know, I'm going to have to write 60 pages of memories that just happened in the last 48 hours or something, right. you know, it, right. it's that kind of stuff. Or how about this? The church, uh, you're supposed to honor your father and mother. So why aren't you, uh, do you have unforgiveness? Yeah. Why? Uh, you, you know, wrong? well, looking, don't look at what's behind, look at what's ahead. I mean, if he's in the hospital, you should be there. What's the matter with you? Everybody else in the family is fine. Yeah. Right? Well, why aren't you calling and checking on your mom? Right. Because they just don't get the depths of danger. Because really, you go home, you're handed a nuclear bomb here, blow up. Literally, you would be dead. I honestly think like I, from things that my mother has, you know, realized that she's also having this, going through this and she's completely, you know, not anywhere close. And she was, she was calling in programming to you. Yeah. She's danger. Danger mm -hmm. of the capital D. Not good, mm -hmm. you know, so and you, when people won't hear, when they won't get it and they won't listen, it, you just can't explain it because they won't hear it. They won't get it. I honestly think it's a failure to understand multiplicity and dissociation. And mind programming and control. In my and control. The Luciferian system. Yeah. Because, and, and this is what my coach, coach has said, like, you know, like with my friends, it's, they've gone through this thing with themselves, but it is a different kind of programming. And, and if you're going to like categorize it, it's more like a civilianized religious stuff mine is military grade it's a different level I've different seen. level and it's complex yeah and it's bloodline and it's it's a lot of stuff and and i'm literally being going through a physical and soul crushing kind of feeling not that I'm being crushed like my soul's being crushed but it like it it physically I have been physical and emotional pain that is off the charts so so yeah well thank you for explaining this to us today this is important and it's really going to help people. So let's go out with the shaking the Luciferian kingdom prayer. You want to shake it? Oh, yeah. We're going to shake it. All right. From where we are seated in Christ Jesus. Where we are seated in Christ Jesus. At the right hand of the Father. Right hand of the Father. The Lord God Almighty says. The Lord God Almighty says. The time has come. The time has come for the Luciferian kingdom to be shaken. For the Luciferian kingdom to be shaken. We decree. We decree that the great shaking, that the great shaking of all who worship Lucifer begin. All who worship Lucifer begin. Your sorceries and sacrifices. Sorceries and sacrifices will not help you. Will not help you. Your protection is removed. Your protection is removed. Let the shaking of the Luciferian kingdom increase. Let the shaking of the Luciferian kingdom increase. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 <laughs> Thank you, Kate. Uh.
<laughs> more joy to come. Oh. <laughs> more to come. I know that he's doing this. Uh, you know, I'm get I'm being healed, and I know it's at an incredibly fast pace. I honestly think that it's just, you know, tough. You're doing good. I'm proud of you, Lisa. Thank you for being my friend, and thank you for what you do for all these survivors. I want you to know that, like. The, what you've done with like your podcast and having the groups and the, the different things, the only God rescue me. Like it, that has been one of the lifesavers for me is to have some place that I can talk and tell what's happening. So thank you. You're welcome. It's my honor. I love you, my friend. I love you, Lisa. Only God could rescue me. Only God could set me free. Only God.